So just to, what's that there? Uh, okay, sorry, just to give you a bit of background, Jupiter is a nonprofit open source endeavor, um, and it broke away from IPython, which stands for Interactive Python, back in 2014. Um, the name Jupiter, as you can see on the slide, is spelt differently. It's spelt with a Y instead of an I. And this is a reference to its core supported languages. And these are namely Ju uh, Julia, Python and R. So you've got the JU for Jupiter, uh, Julia, PY for Python and R at the end. Um, it's probably fair to say, however, that Jupiter is best associated with Python. So the main component of Jupyter Lab is the Jupyter Notebook, but there are other aspects to Jupyter Lab which are useful as well, and I'll be discussing those as well. Okay. So let me just move this across. Um, it's over here. Okay. Can you still see the slide on here, or? Does it have to be? No, it's gone. Ah, okay. I'll have to move it over here a bit. It's a bit annoying. I'll be looking that way a little bit. I'm not being rude. It just seems to be the way the setup is that I can only share it when it's on this monitor. Um, okay. So that's an overview of what Jupyter Lab is. Um, I'll just now give you an overview of installing the software. Um, Okay, so you'll need Python 3 installed um, to be using the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and to actually install it, you can do a pip install. This is probably the easiest way to do it. So there's the command there. It's just Python 3. You use the pip module and then you install JupyterLab. Um, and that should work. If you, if you don't have admin rights, you might want to do a local install or something like that. Um, but that's probably the easiest and most simple way to install Jupyter Lab on your system. I should just mention at this point, however, you might want to consider ins installing it a different way. You could do that um, via, just let someone into the, into the room. Okay, you can do that via Anaconda. So Anaconda is a bundle of Python and R packages and other software which is specially tailored for people involved with data science and scientific analysis. Um, so if you in install this sort of version of Python, lots of um, tools are already available to you. And in fact, JupyterLab will come pre-installed. So you can get Anaconda from the web link you can see there, the anaconda.com. And what we've got here is a screenshot of the Anaconda Navigator. And if you install, if you open that, you see a variety of tools which you can run, such as Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, which is also part of Jupyter Lab, but you can run it separately. And there's other sort of text editors like VS Code and R. So that might be a consideration. If you want to dig into this sort of data analysis bundle, you could always try installing using Anaconda. Okay, so that's how you install the software. So once you've installed it and you've got it up and running, how would you um, how would you start Jupyter Lab? So let me do a new share with you. So what you need to do is open a terminal like this. So this is a terminal, um, and I'm running this actually on a Mac. So if you open the if you click on the terminal icon, you'll see something like this, and this is a command line environment. Um, where you can put in commands using uh, simple word commands, and this will perform some sort of action on your computer. Um, the similar sort of things on Linux, people working in a Linux environment are actually probably much more familiar with a command line environment, or you could do MS-DOS in, um, in a Windows environment. So the first thing I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to navigate to um, what will be my working directory where I'm going to do everything. So I'm just going to go there. But to actually start Jupyter Lab, once it's all installed, set up, if I type in Jupyter Lab, there we go. 
and hopefully this will run. And what it actually does, it um, runs a web server, um, which will then open your default browser on your computer. Which is taking a long time to open. <laughs> ah, no, it is, it is opening. Uh, that had me a little bit worried there. Is it opening up? Okay, good. So I'll just share my browser with you. I just realized you're looking at the, uh, so I'm having to move between different windows here. Okay. So you should be able to see my web browser now. And this has opened up JupyterLab. So as long as it's all opened up, this is what you should see. And you can see basically the layout. There's three sort of areas that should probably bring your attention to. There's the top menu, which is where you have all your commands. So it's essentially like opened up a standard sort of window, uh, your standard sort of Windows type window within a web browser. And this is, you can now run everything all the commands and everything you want to do within this web browser. So what we've got at the top are the list of commands. So in this, we've got like the file commands. And when you click on these, you get a drop down menu that you're probably all quite familiar with. And then you can click on the command that you want to run. So you'll edit commands, view commands and so on. And then if it's quite, can be quite helpful, but to the side of various commands, you can see the keyboard shortcuts as well, if you want to, uh, run everything more quickly without using the menu. So that's the top menu where you see, you know, the useful commands you can run. You've also got a left-hand side menu. And by default, when, the, when JupyterLab opens up, what you will see is your current working directory. And this is essentially a file browser. And you'll see all the files in your current working directory. So I can just extend this a little bit here just by um, clicking on the, on the frame. I can move it to the right to enlarge it. And you can see all the files in here. Also, another useful part of this left-hand side menu is if I click on this little icon here, and then you can see all the lists of commands associated with all the different aspects of JupyterLab. So for example, the Jupyter Notebook, you see all the commands here. And this can be, it's a useful list of all the shortcuts of all the commands. Um, these are grayed out at the moment because I don't have uh, the Jupyter Notebook open, but when it is, these will become uh, black font and you'll be able to click on them and see them more clearly. But that's essentially th that component there. And then here in the center, you've got your main working area. And when you open up a notebook or something like that, or a console, it will display in this central main working area. Okay, so I think the best way to illustrate this is to actually open up a new notebook, which I'll do now. So if you just go to file, then new, and then notebook, you will open a new notebook. And it's going to be a Python 3 notebook. So by default, Python 3 has been chosen um, to run here. So if I just click select, and now we've got a Python 3 notebook set up. So it all looks quite sort of spartan at the moment. There's not, there's not much there. Um, let's minimize this. Uh, okay, so there's not much there. So what, what is actually going on? Well, Essentially, what we have are, are going to be a series of cells, a little bit like Excel, except we'll only have like one uh, column of cells. And these cells can accept text. So they can accept one line of text or multiple line of texts. Um, and there are three different types of cells that you can make. There are code cells in which you can enter Python code. There are markdown cells in which you can enter uh, markdown uh, code. It's a, it's a markup, mark, sort of, it's a language um, where you can render text and you can see it in a, uh, a nicely formatted version. And there's also raw cells. And I'm not, I'm not going to be discussing these in the talk. These can, these won't actually, if you do use these later on, they're not actually rendered by the notebook, but they can be rendered downstream, like when you're making PDF files or something like that. But for this talk, I'll just be talking about these code and markdown cells. Um, so, okay, so I've got a code cell here. You can see it's a code cell because it says code here. And now I can enter Python code. So 
just to illustrate that in the standard way we always do whenever we start in some sort of new programming language, we'll type in hello world. And then, so I've typed in my code and then I can press run. So that's like the little play symbol here. If I press run, you'll see hello world here. So it's a bit like when you type into an interpreter, um, a Python interpreter, you type it in and you get, get the message displayed back to you. So that's hello world. You could click on it again and then put a few more exclamation marks in and I could run it once more. I could run it, I could click the play button again or I could click run here and do run selected cells and it will say hello world. And this time it's created a new cell beneath it as well. Alternatively, you can um, do something like shift enter and that will run it once more. So there are these different ways of running a cell. And also just let bring to your attention, you, when you run the cells, you can run them and you can automatically insert a new cell below, or you could choose not to insert a new cell. Um, but essentially there's different options in the way you run the cells. But essentially it's generally the same sort of idea. You've got a bit of code in here, you'll run it and then it will execute the bit of code. Obviously this is quite a simple bit of code for illustrative purposes, but you, know, you could have a whole chunk of Python code in there and then run it with the click of a button. So that's, that's the sort of basic idea of, um, of the running the code. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about are the markdown cells. Um, so I mentioned briefly before, uh, Markdown is a language that helps you render um, plain text in a nicely formatted form. So let me just illustrate this. If I type in heading one, and I say this is a markdown cell, and I click run as before, what we see is heading one is just return. And there's nothing special about that. That's actually just plain, plain sort of text at the moment. But if I were to paste, if I were to um, type in an a hashtag symbol before heading one and then put in a space and do it. What we see is we've essentially generated larger font and this is essentially it's a heading heading one. It's a level one heading. Uh, just to illustrate that point, if I were to then do two hashtags and type in heading two, the two hashtags denote a, uh, a second tier heading. So we've created automatically titles to our to our cell. But it's, there's a huge amount of variety of what you can actually do in the Markdown language. So for example, if I wanted something in italics, I could type in italics here. Uh, and what I do is I put it between an asterisk and a single asterisk denotes italics. I do that and then I get in italics font. Or for example, if I wanted it in bold, I could do two asterisk, bold like that, run it, and then we get it in bold. And it's really quite versatile, this Markdown uh, language. We could, for example, if I click on this, we could, for example, include a web link. So the way to do this is to put in the name that you'll see on the screen in a square brackets. And then I would put in the, um, the, uh, the URL of the web address. So, like so, so as long as I've typed that in correctly, I've got the word Babram, and then when I click this, yeah, it opens up a new window and it's gone to the Babram, um, the Babram website. So that's quite a nice thing um, to have. So the idea is just sort of getting an idea of the sort of layout of a workbook now. So what we'd have in a, in a Jupyter notebook is you would have chunks of code, and these could then be between the chunks of code, there can be headings to describe what the chunks of code are, and even descriptive text describing what the, uh, the, the notebooks, um, the code actually is doing. So by the end, you'll have like a series of text describing everything and then code performing actions. And that, that essentially forms the bulk of a notebook. Okay. So that's how you make code and markdown cells in your, in your, um, in your workbook. What you can also do, um, what you also bring your attention to, is something called command mode and edit mode. So if I click on a cell, we go into command mode. 
And you can see that, if you can see that here, it's quite small maybe on the screen, but it says mode edit. And that means that we can just edit the cell. And that's what we've just been doing before, which will make sense. But if I click outside the cells, this now changes to command mode. And command mode means we can manipulate the workbook in a different way. So now, for example, if I type in the letter A, you'll see that I've created a new cell. So now the, what this, because we're in command mode, for typing in keyboard commands, uh, keys on the keyboard executes a series of commands in the notebook. So A, for example, in, in, um, adds a cell. If I were to type in DD, it would delete a cell like that. Um, if I were to uh, click on here, for example, and then click C and then V, that will copy and then paste the cell like so. So what we can do is with command mode, we can manipulate the whole workbook by you know, adding new cells, deleting cells. And if you look in the help associated with Jupyter Notebooks, you'll see a whole range of options that you can do in command mode. Um, what I should also just mention as well, you can also enter command mode when you're in a cell by pressing escape. That gets you into command mode and pressing enter returns you to the cell as well. Or of course you can just click outside as before. Okay, so that's how you would start to build up a notebook. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of information on the ordering of a notebook because it's not necessarily that intuitive to um, somebody who is just used with writing Python code. So let me type a little bit of code in here. So a little bit of Python code. We're going to assign the name X to the value one. And we run this and then we type in X and we're going to see what X is and it has the value one. And that all makes sense to us. Um, I mean, that's just what we've assigned. So here we would expect one to be returned. So let's just try this again. We'll do X is two. We'll run that and then we'll get X back and we see two is returned. So this is all making complete sense. Now let's just go to this cell here and run it. And if we run this, we get two back. Now that might not make complete sense. I know we've, because essentially when you look at the code book now, uh, the notebook, you'll see that we've got X is one, then we type in X and we've got two returned. So what's happening here? Essentially it is because we have the last cell we actually executed was this one here. So two, the value of two is what's saved in the namespace. And then when, when we went back here, um, X is still assigned the value two. And then when we click run, we see that two is returned. So that's important to know. If you're hopping around in your notebook, the order of the notebook may not, may not necessarily con correspond exactly to where the code is being executed behind the scenes. Having said that, you can easily see what's going on by the numbering systems here. So the numbers next to the code cells um, give you an indication of the order in which the, um, the code is being executed. So if we go here, for example, we, we're starting off at five, and then this cell has got the number 10, but then you notice the cell below it has got the number seven. So it's telling us the actual order is, is going X equals one, X equals two, then we do X, then it has the value two, then we go back here, we're typing X again, and it has the value two. So just do watch out for that if you're hopping around in your, in your notebook. Having said that, if you want to sort of reset everything, if you go into here and then run all the cells, what will happen is all the cells will now be run in order. So if you notice, there's no jumping around with the numberings here, it's all going up incrementally. I should just point out as well, actually, we're starting at the number 11. So we don't start at number one when we run all the cells. It keeps a track of how many, um, how many commands have already been run in the past. But uh, yeah, so, so that's how you would run everything in the notebook in order. One more thing I should just bring into your attention in case it's not obvious is, is for example, how things are kept in memory. So, or in the namespace. So if I did Y equals 10 and were to run that, and then we did Y, would see that 10 is returned, which makes, makes sense. That all seems quite logical. But now if we go into uh, 
command mode and delete those cells. And we were to type Y, okay. Even though that is not present, Y is still kept in memory, okay. So even though we've not assigned it, it's still there in memory. So how would we want to reset all the variables? Um, what we would do is we would run once more, but we would restart the kernel and run all cells. So we're not just running all the cells, we're restarting the kernel. And when we do this, we do a restart and it's now basically starting from scratch. So you'll know the, notice the number here starts at one. And now if we were to type Y in here, it should no longer be in the namespace and you would get an error message here saying that Y is not defined. So that's just a little bit of information on how you enter code and markdown into the notebook and um, how you structure your notebook and just a little bit about how things are kept in memory when you run it and how the execution is ordered. Um, one useful little feature of the notebook is something called introspection. So this is not actually a Python command, it's a notebook command. So introspection is where you can get the, it's, it's a feature of a programming language where you can determine the type of an object at runtime. So to perform this, if you type in a question mark and we were to type in Y, for example, and we were to run this, oh, sorry, I mean X, uh, question mark X, and we were to run this, you would get information about what X is. So it tells you it's an integer, tells you how it would be represented as a string, and it gives you a whole range of more information about X. Um, you can also do this this way by double question mark X, and for some data types, this will give you even more information. Or in fact, you can put the question mark or question marks behind the name that you're interested in, like so, and that will give you information. And this is quite simple here. We have a simple value X, but you can imagine if you've got a function or you've got a complex data structure, this can be really quite helpful to find out the sort of objects that are in your Jupyter notebook. So that's, um, yeah, that's essentially how you would lay out a notebook. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open a new notebook and I'm going to talk about you some other features in the Jupyter notebook. I'll just do that. I'll just check nobody's asked any. Okay. That's good. Okay, let's just go back here. Right, so I will open a notebook that I've just prepared. So what I can do is I can go to the file browser here and I see there is a notebook I've made already. And I can, it tells, you can tell it's a notebook by the little icon here and it ends with the Python notebook um, file extension IPYNB and that tells you it's a notebook. Uh, and if I double click on this, it should hopefully open, which it has, uh, which is good. This is the pre-saved notebook. And what you can see, it's actually not a great deal in there. Um, but what I've done is I have hidden um, the content of the cells in the notebook. So if I click on these cells, you'll see um, the content of the cells will appear. So that's how you can hide or show cells in a notebook. And when a cell is hidden, you'll know it's hidden by these three little dots or this ellipsis symbol here. Okay, so that's how you can show and hide cells in a notebook. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about now is something called magic commands. So these are useful little commands that you can run on single lines called line magics, or you can run them on whole uh, entire cells called cell magics. And they're very useful commands. They're, they're not actually part of Python, they're part of the notebook, but they really increase the power and versatility of the notebook. So here's an example. So here's a cell, it's a code cell. And if I run this, basically it's just assign the value one to X, two to Y, and then the string three to Z. So that's all very fine. So, and that all makes sense. And now the next thing I want to do is run this line magic. So you can tell it's a magic because it has a percent sign at the start. 
Uh, that's the way you do what you know the line magic. And the line magic command I'm going to run is the who command. And if I run this, it returns x, y, and z. So what this is doing, it's returning all the names that you currently hold in memory. Uh, and that all makes sense because I opened this notebook and I created x, y, and z. So that's a really useful way if you're just working through a notebook and you can't keep track of what you've actually stored in memory. If you just do this who magic command, it will return what's there. Uh, likewise, there is a line magic for history. So you can probably guess what this does. If I run this, you see all the commands that I've run in the notebook, which is quite helpful. Just bear in mind, this might not necessarily be the same as the uh, the actual structure of the notebook, because you may have chopped and changed um, the contents of your notebook, but the actual commands that are in history will all be saved here. Um, so yeah, they're all the commands that you've run during this notebook session before restarting the kernel. Um, another useful magic is PWD, and what happens here if you run that, it will print your working directory. And this is basically, it's the, it's the folder where I'm currently working. So this is the file structure of my computer. So I'm working in a folder called Bite Size Bioinformatics Jupyter Lab, which itself is in a folder called Desktop and so on. And that's quite useful. And that makes sense as well, because right at the start, before I opened the notebook, um, when I was in the shell, I navigated to this location. Okay. And another useful line magic is LS magic. And if you run that, it gives you a list of all the magics available. So all the line magics, if I click here, you can see them. There's a whole range of magics that you can run that do a variety of things in your notebook. And then also here you see a list of all the cell magics. Okay, so that's a really useful command if you want to um, find out more about magics or you need an aid memoir to, to remember the particular magic you need. Okay, so that's uh, line magics, which run on single lines. And then we have cell magics, which encompass multiple uh, lines in a cell. So here's an example. So as I mentioned before, you have a percent sign, but because it's a cell magic, instead of just one percent sign, you have two percent signs. And we're going to run the line magic write file um, we're going to run the line, the cell magic, sorry, write file. And um, what we, what this does, it will create a file and it will write the text below the command into that file. And it's going to call the file hello.py. So if I run this, what you should see is a new file called hello.py appear here. So let me just try that. Let me run it. And you should have just seen that appear here. So we've created this new file, which will contain this text here. And you've also seen this little output here to let you know it's done what you've said. So this cell magic has created this new file. And that's a useful way to put text directly into a file in your current working directory. OK, so you may have sort of noticed that several of these cell magics actually um, are very, uh, do the same thing as uh, shell commands. So if you work in a command line environment, you will already be familiar with these shell commands. Um, but you can run shell commands directly from Jupyter notebooks. And you do that just by putting an exclamation mark before the shell command. So here the shell command ls star.py, that will list all the um, files ending .py. And if I run that, um, it's returned one value, which is hello.py. And if you look in this current folder where I am, you'll see there's only one file in there that ends.py, and that's, that's the file that we just created, hello.py. So that all sort of makes sense. So that's a useful way that you can run shell commands directly from the notebook. Um, also, what's very useful and what you'll need to do when you're doing research and analysis is embed different types of items in your notebook. So a common item that you'll want to embed in a notebook is a table. So here's a little bit of code here. It's a Python code. And what we're doing is that we're importing a Seaborn module called Seaborn, which is a um, very well used uh, module for producing nice quality graphs. 
And what also is useful about the module Seaborn is it comes with, um, with data sets um, already included. So these are data sets that you can are ready to use and experiment with. And one of them is this data set called Iris. And I am going to display Iris here in the notebook by running this bit of code. So you don't need to know exactly what's going on here, but essentially I'm going to um, display the table that I've made. Uh, when I run this, um, oops. That's quite strange. Well, this was wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, that took a bit longer than I was expecting. That had me worried. Um, so here is the table, which you can see displayed. Um, uh, essentially, it's a large table, which will be 150 rows by five columns. So it's not displaying all the data. What it does in the center of the data, it's sort of We've got a little ellipsis symbols here, so it's removing a large chunk of the data so you can't see it. But you've got an overview of what the table looks like. You can see the column headers there in a nice bold uh, font, and you can see the, uh, the rows in a nice bold font as well. Um, and it's all nicely presented. And you, you can play around with the settings to change the amount of data that's actually displayed. So you can um, produce... Uh, produce tables that way um, and include them in your data, in, in your notebook. You can also produce graphs as well. So here again, I've got this data set from the Seaborn module. And I've also imported the matplotlib module, um, which is another tool, another module within Python, which is well used for producing plots. Um, and what I've done is I've created a scatter plot of the width against the length of the sepals in this data set and that's displayed here. So that's how you would go about displaying a graph and you could create any sort of graph you like. You create bar charts, line graphs, anything you want. You just run the matplotlib code, run it and then it'll be displayed in your workbook. So what we're doing here is we're building up a nice workbook now where we've got headings, we could have descriptive text in here, then we have the bits of code, so it's clear to see anyone who understands Python what we're doing, and then we've got the results being displayed as well. So this is a nice way to present your analysis and results. And then as we go on, we can also embed something called LaTeX. Um, so LaTeX is another sort of markup language uh, uh, where we can um, format text. But what it's particularly really nicely used for, for what people mainly use it for, are for rendering formulae. So these are notoriously quite difficult to include in documents, but using LaTeX, they can be rendered really quite nicely. So what we see here is this Euler's identity, and then we have a nice formula here that's been rendered. You might not be able to say it, see it clearly, but you can, if you, if you zoom in on here, you can see that we have the E and then and that's been um, to the power i pi above that. And then if you double click on this, what you can see is the contents of this, of this markdown cell. And what you can see is regular text here, but what you also have is LaTeX. And LaTeX is rendered between two dollar symbols. So once you've got the formula, you write it in LaTeX, you put it between the two dollars, and then it will be rendered in your notepad. Uh, Jupyter Notebook like so. Similarly, you can, if you embed LaTeX between two dollar symbols, it's rendered slightly differently. Um, Strange. Just working before. Yeah, okay. Um, I think my computer's 
got a lot of processes running at the moment. But, um, okay, so, so it's rendering the LaTeX as well. But what it's doing is instead of, well, we have the $2. So this means now the LaTeX is being um, not raised on the same line, but it's being raised on a, on a, generated on the line below. So this is like inline LaTeX, which is on the same line. And then in this version, it's not being generated on the same line because we have the $2. Um, but that's essentially the way we can include LaTeX in a document. Um, what we can also do as well is we can embed HTML. So HTML is another sort of uh, language where you can um, uh, format text. And it's used in, um, it's used very widely in web development. So web pages often use HTML to arrange their layout and their content and that sort of thing. So if you've got a bit of HTML that you want to embed in your workbook, you use one of these cell magics. So you use percent percent HTML, that's the command. And then if you put the, uh, the HTML code beneath that, you can then render it. And what you can see here is I have a link to our Bayern Bioinformatics webpage, and we've embedded that in our workbook. So if you want to do that, you can quite easily do that in your workbook as well, okay, in your notebook. And then for the last bit about the notebooks, I want to talk about sharing, because sharing really is quite important. Um, you made a notebook, and then you want to give it to people. So, so how can you do that? Um, one way to do that is to convert it into a simple HTML document. So if you go to file and then you do um, export notebook as, and then one way to do this is export. There are other options, but you could just export to HTML. Um, and what will happen is you will get a downloaded HTML file here. And then I will open that up. And you'll see that everything in the notebook has now been rendered in a read-only HTML file. Um, I actually have had been playing around with my Jupyter uh, settings. So we've got a dark theme set here. So um, that's why it looks a different color from the other, from the Jupyter notebook that I had open before. Um, but of course you can play around with that and you can set it to any custom settings you like. But essentially you've made an HTML file now, which you can send to people. It doesn't run, but it, it shows all the execution, the output, the graphs. And then people can look at this, look at your code and look at the results. And that's quite a nice way to share it with other people. Um, another thing I, I just wanted to bring your attention to is this Jupyter Notebooks gallery. So this is an external link. It's on a site called GitHub. So GitHub is a site where people can share code and collaborate and that sort of thing. Um, so, but on here, people have deposited on this GitHub repository, repository people have download, um, uploaded a whole range of different Jupyter notebooks. So if I click on one, for example, uh, well, let's, let's try this one. So this is, um, this is somebody has done some machine learning to predict uh, PewDiePie's daily subscribers. So um, this is another, another famous YouTube channel um, out there. Um, but yeah, so somebody has uploaded some uh, code, a Jupyter notebook code to this GitHub repository, and you can see it here. So that's quite a nice way to visualize it. But what you can also do, which is quite nice with Jupyter Lab, is they have this thing called MB Viewer. So if you click on this, you get a, a web page here. And in here, you can put a li link to the notebook, which is on the, uh, on the GitHub site. So what I mean by that is if I go to the GitHub site, and uh, let's do this. I've got lots of windows open, which is causing trouble. Okay, if I copy this URL, which is to the uh, Python notebook site, uh, Jupyter notebook, which ends IPy NB, and I paste that into here. Um, what I and I click go. What it will now do is render that Jupyter notebook on GitHub into a Jupyter notebook format. So that's really quite nice. So that means that you can work 
collaboratively on a Jupyter notebook, or you can put together a Jupyter notebook and share it with people that you want to share it with. And then you can, um, uh, they can use that to use this website here to render the, um, the file and, and visualize it, which is quite nice. Also, if you look at this, it would have created a new URL, which includes the mbviewer.jupyter.org link before the GitHub um, URL. So essentially, you can just share this link with people, and now they can view um, the Jupyter Notebook online. So that's quite a nice way that people can get together and share Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so that pretty much brings the Jupyter Notebook part of this to an end. Um, but before we get to the end of the talk, I just wanted to talk about some of the other features in Jupyter Lab. Um, Jupyter Notebook is by, you know, by far, by far the most um, useful feature and the feature that most people probably use. The Jupyter Lab is really quite nice because it does have other tools as well. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of those now. Um, so the first one I wanted to just look at is if we go back here to new, um, where is this? Uh, file new, here we go. You can see there is a range of, we can create a new notebook, but we can create a range of other things as well, like a console, a terminal, a text file, a markdown file. So I'm just gonna give you an overview of these. Um, if I click on the console, this will open a Python uh, three interpreter uh, environment. Um, so if anybody's opened this in a shell, they've typed in Python 3 in the shell, they, they know what to expect. If I type in, for example, print pi in here, and then uh, run this, you'll see the command is sent to the interpreter and we get high return. So this is quite a nice way that you can just open a little Python in a shell and work with it. So essentially we've got like a sort of integrated environment here now within our browser where we can do lots of Python, Python work and analysis. What we could also do is open, um, we go to file new, we could open a text file. So if we did that, we can just use this essentially a bit like notepad and we can enter text in here and we can save text files. <coughs> but it's also a nice little text editor in its own right. So remember earlier on, we created this hello.py Python file. Well, if I double click on this, the text editor will open it and it has edited it, it has formatted it in a way. So basically it's understanding the Python languages, the language, and it's formatting the text in a way that's easier to make easier for us to read. So for example, the, the text between the speech marks is in red and then the for command is highlighted in bold. So that's quite a nifty little text editor we get for free when we use Jupyter Lab, which is, which is really quite handy. Um, you know, and if you wanna work outside your notebook and put some code together, this is quite a nice little place to do that. Um, also, we have a markdown editor. So I, I could open a new markdown file, but I've got a pre-prepared one here. So if I double click on this, we see that we have got a markdown file in here and you can see all the text and it understands it's marked down and it's edited it accordingly. So headings are in a nice bold blue font and, and all the different things are in a different font um, or different color or what have you. Also what's quite nice if you right click on this and then click preview, you get a nice little preview of your notebook here. Um, of your um, markdown file here. So you can scroll through and you can see how it would be rendered on your screen. Um, but you can see how the markdown file would be rendered. So that's really quite nice. So you can edit in here, then you can refresh it and you can see how the markdown would be rendered to the end user. So that's really quite a nice little tool. Um, okay, so we've got that, which is quite nice. Um, another couple of things we've got as well. We do have a command shell if you wanted. So this is like a terminal I opened earlier. Um, if you run this, um, it's just like opening a, a Linux shell or the terminal shell on a Mac. So if I did ls, for example, that's the shell command, you can see all the files listed in my current working directory. 
So that's quite nice. You can stay in your browser. You don't need to go away and open a separate terminal. <coughs> uh, sorry. What you can also do, um, and also really useful feature in Jupyter Labs, is a feature to open um, data files. So if you've got a comma separated values or a tab delimited file, you can open them here. So we've got one here, it's called sample table.csv. So when I say comma separated values, I mean essentially we've got like a, a spreadsheet type format where we've got rows separated by new lines and then different columns separated by commas. So it's a bit like an Excel workbook and you can see that rendered here. And that's a really nice way to visualize um, a table. What's really, really helpful with this is that it will open gigantic files. So unlike Excel, which will open, I mean, I say only, but only a million rows, um, you can click on this and you can open millions and millions of rows. And it sort of works behind the scenes that it, it, it doesn't put everything into memory once or something, you know. So, so what that means is you can scroll around a huge file really quickly and easily with no real overheads. And it's, it's a really nice way to work. Um, and that can be really helpful with enormous data files that you often work with in data analysis. So that's a really nice little, little tool that we have in Jupyter Labs, which I find very helpful. And then finally, you know, what can be quite useful sometimes when you're working with images, you've made some sort of image, maybe you've made a, an image of a, a graph and you've rendered it to a PNG or a JPEG and you want to see what it looks like you can just use a viewer within Jupyter Labs. So um, there's an image here, it's called jupytergod.jpg. If I double click on this, it will open it up. And it's a big image and I can scroll around, but I, I can't really make out what it is all in one go. So if I press um, the, the minus key, hyphen key, you can, you can zoom out. And if you press plus, you zoom in. I think it's actually minus hyphen and equals. But that's essentially how you zoom in and out. And then with the square brackets, you can rotate it left or right. And then you can reset it by pressing zeros. So that's a really quite a nice little feature that you've got to look at the, uh, the sort of output that you may have created um, in these sort of pic picture formats. OK, so. That's a real overview of Jupyter Lab. I've talked you through the main components of Jupyter Notebooks, where you can write code, um, you can write free text to describe your code, and then you can interactively um, build graphs and tables and charts and all sorts in, in your notebooks. And then, of course, there are ways, really nice ways that you can share it by exporting it to HTML or sharing it via GitHub. So that's a, a useful tool that you have in notebooks. And then you've got this nice work interactive environment within your browser in Jupyter Labs where you can open up terminals, mark down files, mark down browsers. Um, you can open shells and you can look at pictures and enormous uh, data sets. So I hope you find that useful. I think Jupyter is a very useful way of working. It can be used for R, you know, other languages. I think most people are most familiar working with Python in this way. But yeah, if, you, if you're curious, just give it a go. And yeah, I think people at Babram, if you've got any questions, give me a shout. But that, that really much, pretty much brings the seminar to an end. Unless any, anybody's got any questions, I can, I can try and help now or after the, um, after the talk. OK.